Thank you very much for joining our study. This is a personal understanding uh, of the Baha'i Writings. It is only my view on it. For an official view, turn to the Baha'i Scriptures themselves, please, and visit baha'i.org. Um, I wish to thank the uh, Baha'i World Administration, uh, all those that are serving their communities out there. And please note that there is an audio file, uh, so you can listen to this presentation instead of viewing it. And also, any quotes that are used will be in a PDF in the description. So today we're going to be covering the topic of the International Auxiliary Language, a principle of the Baha'i Faith. Uh, naturally, as with any of our presentations, uh, this is my own personal opinion, just trying to share thoughts uh, on the topic. Uh, please refer to the Baha'i Writings and the um, Worldwide Baha'i website, baha'i.org. So today, um, this is a fundamental principle of the Baha'i Faith, one of the social teachings of, of Baha'u'llah, uh, the International Auxiliary Language. And we'll just start off with a quote or two to begin. O members of Parliament throughout the world, select ye a single language for the use of all on earth, and adopt ye likewise a common script. This will be the cause of unity could ye but comprehend it, and the greatest instrument for promoting harmony and civilization, would that ye might understand." This is from Baha'u'llah in the Most Holy Book. And for many within the Baha'i Faith, we know this as a fundamental principle. And we hope to actually explore, uh, if you will, beyond the surface layer of it, and try to see some of the other aspects of the World International Auxiliary Language. So we're going to move on. The next quote is from Abdul Baha from a promulgation of Universal Peace. Baha'u'llah has proclaimed the adoption of universal language. A language shall be agreed upon by which unity will be established in the world. Each person will require training in two languages, his native tongue and a universal auxiliary form of speech. This will facilitate intercommunication and dispel the misunderstandings which the barriers of language have occasioned in the world." So in this first quote we see actually that it's not uh, a universal language at the expense of other languages, but that each individual should be learning too. Their mother tongue, but also this universal or auxiliary language, so that misunderstandings can be dispelled and intercommunication uh, throughout the globe can actually be developed. Today, the greatest need of the world of humanity is discontinuance of the existing misunderstandings among nations. This can be accomplished through the unity of language. Unless the unity of languages is realized, the most great peace and the oneness of the human world cannot be effectively organized and established, because the function of language is to portray the mysteries and secrets of human hearts. The heart is like a box, and language is the key. Only by using the key can we open the box and observe the gem it contains. Therefore, the question of an auxiliary international tongue has the utmost importance. Through this means, international education and training become possible. The evidence and history of the past can be acquired. The spread of the known facts of the human world depends upon language. The explanation of divine teachings can only be through this medium. As long as diversity of tongues and lack of comprehension of other languages continue, these glorious aims cannot be realized. Therefore, the very first service of the world of man is to establish this auxiliary international means of communication. It will become the cause of the tranquility of the human commonwealth. Through it, sciences and arts will be spread among the nations, and it will prove to be the means of the progress and development of all races. We must endeavor with all our powers to establish this international auxiliary language throughout the world. It is my hope that it may be perfected through the bounties of God 
and that intelligent men may be selected from the various countries of the world to organize an international congress whose chief end will be the promotion of this universal medium of speech. He's talking about how the heart is like a box, and actually it, we need language to open it. And I know myself, uh, I traveled throughout the world for several years with my wife. Uh, we lived in Asia, both in China, Korea, and also in Taiwan, and also in the Middle East. And it was an exquisite experience <laughs> because we got to see all these different cultures and all these different places and meet just scores of wonderful, wonderful people. At the same time, I love discourse. I love dialogue and self-expression and be able to share my thoughts and feelings with other people. And it was very difficult because I would be meeting someone and I can't actually share with them what I really think. Because even those who would speak English, I would actually have to take my English right, and make it profoundly simple. But I'm used to being able to use the whole expanse of my vocabulary to share not just my thoughts, but my feelings. You know, the person on the other end, I could see the exact same, uh, the exact same barrier. They're trying to you know, share with me their thoughts and feelings, but it can't actually get through the veil of language. And I even mean, even to the point of the expressions of caring and love, it's like you want to be able to say something beautifully and poetically, so that you can open your own box and share the treasures inside through language. And so does these other people, but you're both fumbling around and you can't actually share back and forth. And while I was able to develop some beautiful relationships while we were overseas in Asia and in the Middle East, uh, many of them were profoundly hindered. And what honestly is coming out often is actually almost uh, simplistic, even childlike language, attempting to express deep, mature and sophisticated emotions and deep, mature, sophisticated thought, all clamped actually by the obstacle of language. It's even in the area of you know trying to be humorous, to be joyful and uplifting with people, because so much of the context of language is needed to actually express, honestly, the sophistication of thought that actually comes along with joyful interplay and banter and humor. Uh, most often, actually, for myself, uh, it would be completely misunderstood. A person would miss the point, right? I think that. So it's not just in like the practical aspects of you know like political languages or legal languages, uh, while those are actually important. In many ways, it's just the, the the real genuine interaction between people. I think even the one of the unfortunate things I myself I'm a, I'm a student of music, and I actually have a barrier. I actually study Persian music, but because I don't actually speak Farsi, I can't actually get the full, if you will. The full richness of the experience, because these are actually poetic works expressed in music, and I cannot get through to the, actually the beautiful richness of this cultural heritage. I know even myself, I try to study languages, and they're very difficult. But I actually lament the fact that there are whole cultural expressions, whole literary expressions like musical expressions, poetic expressions, that I, I'll never actually get to taste the sweetness of them, because I don't have the facility of language in order to extract them. Another part of this quote, it talks about the means of international education. Uh, my wife and I lived in South Korea, and uh, three of our really good friends were actually Sudanese. and uh, They were actually uh, Arabic speakers, who were actually in South Korea to study uh, at a master's level, I would actually have to study with lectures in Korean through English textbooks. <laughs> so I actually witnessed this like very viscerally with these three friends of ours for a year, because they're trying to actually gain an education, an education for which in their own language and in their own country they don't have the resources for. But in order to do so, they're actually having to jump two linguistic hurdles in order to obtain this. And so often we have these exquisite rich minds of knowledge and wisdom that cannot actually get across the world, both in the, in the practical sense, if you will, and in the more idealistic and philosophical sense. We're again hindered by actually sharing these ideas. And even as we're talking, in the, you know, for example, in the poetic realms, uh, so often uh, 
when we're actually transforming these exquisite works from language to language, we end up losing in the mix. It talks here also about uh, the evidence and history of the past can be acquired. Because, for example, I know within the history of science, one context, uh, there are actually Arabic manuscripts uh, all throughout Europe uh, that were actually transferred uh, from Islamic Spain that are actually in uh, actually like Christian abbeys and in libraries all throughout Europe, and they actually contain information about that period that we can't access. There are histories, say, of China, for example, or of anywhere in the Middle East and Africa that we're unable to really understand because of this barrier of language. With an international auxiliary language, suddenly all these different areas of high culture, poetry, music, drama, literature, uh, scientific findings, historical findings, all these things suddenly become opened up to us. Because I cannot access much of the histories and history and culture, say, of China or India, because they're actually held behind a veil. My ability to appreciate the richness of that culture suddenly gets blocked, walled off behind a linguistic obstacle. A world language will either be invented or chosen from among the existing languages and will be taught in the schools of all the federated nations as an auxiliary to their mother tongue. A world script, a world literature, a uniform and universal system of currency, of weights and measures, will simplify and facilitate intercourse and understanding among the nations and races of mankind. So once again, uh, we have the principle of actually the two languages that each should be taught, their own mother tongue and this universal auxiliary language to, f to facilitate intercourse and understanding. Uh, in this quote, actually, once we actually have a world script and a world literature, and I, I wanted to highlight this because it, it's actually not that this language is just for everyday chit chat or just business dealings. Uh, it's actually meant eventually to become a, a truly rich language to be able to express the hearts and minds of each and every one of these uh, different language groups, so that we can really, truly begin to get to the philosophy, the, you know what I mean, the poetry, the, the literature of these different uh, linguistic groups, so that we can facilitate intercourse and understanding, that really a global culture can actually be created. And as we'll see, this is a fundamental principle of the development of an international auxiliary language, is the, is the actual creating of a global consciousness within humankind. One of the great steps towards universal peace would be the establishment of a universal language. Baha'u'llah commands that the servants of humanity should meet together and either choose a language which now exists or form a new one. A universal language would make intercourse possible with every nation. Thus it would be needful to know two languages only, the mother tongue and the universal speech. The latter would enable a man to communicate with any and every man in the world. A third language would not be needed. To be able to talk with a member of any race and country without requiring an interpreter, how helpful and restful to all. An international congress should be formed, consisting of delegates from every nation in the world, Eastern as well as Western. This congress should form a language that could be acquired by all, and every country would thereby reap great benefit. Until such a language is in use, the world will continue to feel the vast need of this means of intercourse. Difference of speech is one of the most fruitful causes of dislike and distrust that exists between nations, which are kept apart by their inability to understand each other's language more than by any other reason. If everybody could speak one language, how much more easy it would be to serve humanity. So suddenly we have this issue of the International Congress come up, that it should be consisting of delegates from every nation in the world, Eastern as well as Western, and that this should be actually decided, and it's either to choose an existing language or form a new one. What we'll find soon here is there are actually other aspects of this universal language that we would have to take into account. Baha'u'llah enjoins the adoption of a universal language and script. 
His writings envisage two stages in this process. The first stage is to consist of the selection of existing language or an inventing one, which would then be taught in all the schools of the world as an auxiliary to the mother tongues. The governments of the world, through their parliaments, are called upon to effect this momentous enactment. The second stage, in the distant future, would be the eventual adoption of one single language and common script for all on earth. The love and effort put into Esperanto will not be lost, he answered. But no one person can construct a universal language. It must be made by a council representing all countries, and must contain words from different languages. It will be governed by the simplest rules, and there will be no exceptions. Neither will there be gender nor extra and silent letters. Everything indicated will have but one name. In Arabic, there are hundreds of names for the camel. In the schools of each nation, the mother tongue will be taught, as well as the revised universal language. This quote in particular um, actually begins to delineate the, 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 the prerequisites for this universal auxiliary language. And oftentimes in my discussions, we mention <laughs> the fact that Baha'u'llah taught the adoption of an international auxiliary language, but we don't actually explore what are the parameters. And there's more quotes than the ones that we're actually reviewing here. But it's telling us that it must contain words from different languages. It's to be chosen by an international congress. It has to have simple rules with no exceptions, no gender or extra or silent letters. So we actually have, a, actually have to have a perfectly phonetic script, right? We don't have a female sun and a male moon, as in some languages. And the rules of it must be strict, with no exceptions. And I know for myself, uh, I taught uh, English overseas for three years. And you, you don't really get to, as an English speaker, you don't really get to realize the amount of effort and time actually wasted. Um, I remember one of my friends, who was actually from Serbia, said, Do you realize that we don't have spelling bees <laughs> in Serbia? Because your script is perfectly phonetic. So you actually don't have to actually spend the time learning all the exceptions, all the different pronunciations of different you know, groupings of vowels, or the different ways we can say even th. So you actually released a burden off of people. Uh, as with actually the, the designation of gender to specific nouns, um, I lived in the Middle East, and trying to remember whether something was female or male actually really makes a difference, because so do your actual adjectives have to be female or male. And the, another aspect of this is it actually says it must contain uh, words from different languages. And I think this is a very important point, um, and we can bring actually these two things together. Um, for example, there are many languages in the world that are already very far-reaching. Uh, English is obviously one of them, Mandarin, Arabic, French, Spanish, right? Yet in the end, it actually says the revised universal language. And it's important to note this, because this language is going to be chosen by a council of all existing nations. And it has these rules, no silent letters, no gender, it has to have words from different languages. So whatever language, whether it's an existing language or a language that is fashioned, it's going to have to be revised. So you might take a language, say like French, which actually has gendered nouns, and that would actually have to be revised to remove the gender. Uh, we might have another language that actually doesn't have that, but actually does not have a phonetic script where you can just read it directly, or the grammatical rules will have to be changed. The, the aspect of containing words from every existing language, I think, addresses uh, a, ch a particular challenge of a universal language. Because oftentimes, um, languages that are very universal in this day, sometimes are caught up in historical, uh, political issues. And people see it as someone else's language. Languages have histories, and they've been spread in various ways. We often have language spread by, say, economic either spread or even domination. Uh, honestly, English in our day is actually one of these languages. 
Um, we also have political imposition of language. Sometimes uh, within, a, within a specific country, actually, like an, a specific language will be enforced universally, often at the expense and even death of certain languages, which again can cause harm and hurt throughout history. Um, also religious. Uh, sometimes it's actually through um, religious missionary work or even religious political and economic domination or exploitation that many of these languages have actually spread. And what, what Baha'u'llah here is talking about, and what Abdu Baha and the Shogi Effendi are actually sharing with us, that this language itself is actually meant to foster a global identity, a vision of ourselves as a member of the human species. So we're really trying to actually in the future, develop a language that is reflective of that. One that it obviously facilitates the ease of learning, so children or even people who are adults in that day don't have to labor intensely to learn it. But it's actually pristine in its ability of intercourse. But it doesn't also doesn't have all of potentially some of the past baggage that it might be like imposed on a certain language. So that in the end, it can actually represent the human family and enable us, without anything being held back, to share our thoughts and feelings and philosophy and sciences and arts across the globe for the betterment of all humanity.